Aloha. I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, in Moana Nui Akea. Today, we're focusing on corporations and the roles of transnational corporations, looking at its impact on our daily lives and our fundamental human rights and freedoms. Today, we're very fortunate to be joined by an amazing advocate focusing on the emerging roles of corporations and how international law is organizing to ensure accountability. Thank you, Emmanuel, for joining us. My pleasure. Emmanuel, could you share with us a bit what has been the role of corporations, especially as we look at how people have been challenging them to actually uphold basic human rights and actually be positive catalysts for change instead of in a way challenging the international norms? So, I mean, over the last, I would say, 15 years about since major, I mean, there's been major incidents in terms of environmental pollution, in terms of uh, violations of human rights. We've we've heard of the Nike sweatshops in the, in the 90s, and that started the movement and raising awareness about what are the potential uh, human rights violations coming, you know, from supply chains all around the world, large multinationals, as you were uh, mentioning. And that kind of created the, a paradigm shift in the consumer's perspectives. And since then, there's been gradual changes in the um, international framework, um, more from um, guidelines, um, recommendations, uh, principles, standards that companies ought to follow um, within their operations in at HQ, if we can say that like that, as well as their in business units and their supply chains all around the world. Those, um, these guidelines, which one was the UNGPs, the UN guiding principles that were drafted in um, 2011, started really like a major shift in, in saying, you know, the government have, of course, the responsibility um, to uphold violations towards human rights that are committed within, within their countries, but also the private sector plays a major role. And the private sector should be part of that uh, process of protecting, um, understanding, and remedying where you know, violations have been uh, committed. So this is one in 2011 that UNGPs, the UN Guiding Principles, started like a movement and raising awareness not only within the population, the consumers, but also within the responsibilities that corporations have with respect to, for example, forced labor, um, modern slavery, um, land rights, uh, indigenous peoples groups, uh, protecting sacred lands, uh, pollution, water um, usage and refuse um, that are uh, distributed in the water, contamination of the water, et cetera. So many different violations have been reported over the last, yeah, 15, 20 years and now much more in the media um, that there are standards that are also, that apply to specific sectors, to specific um, industries. And now we're looking, I mean, last a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, there was the, um, what we refer as the triple, uh, the, the CS triple D, which is the corporate, the sustainability, basically, uh, or the obligations of large corporations to conduct uh, due diligence um, across their operations. And that's the latest EU directives that was voted two weeks ago that is imposing, you know, up corporations to do human rights due diligence um, within the operations worldwide um, at the moment that they are EU-based or selling on the EU market. And that's a big shift uh, because that's, you know, imposing human rights due diligence um, to a lots of companies, not as many as they had hoped for. But this is, again, raising a bit the... Um, the standard, the awareness, and the obligations on corporations to comply and understand where they potentially violate human rights and have an impact on the environment. I don't know if that was a short answer or that's... <laughs> no, I appreciate that very much. And it's good to look at corporations in their entirety because really for a long time, 
really since the first forces of globalization, corporations have always been in collaboration with the church and with countries to focus on profits and to actually organize to guarantee the interest of those transnational entities. And it's interesting when you look at Ruggy and you look at the guiding principles, because there were some efforts earlier with David Weisbrot and others looking at transnational corporate. Could you explain why in 2011 you thought that we met this threshold and were able to accomplish what hadn't been done in the past to, in a way, focus, as you said, on modern day slavery and see what's possible to change, to respect, protect, as you said, and fulfill and make sure that we head in that right direction? I mean, as you said earlier, you know, it's, I think it's a combination of several factors. Um, globalization, bringing, you know, the consumers closer to the actual manufacturers where the productions of garments, of agro uh, produce, of the extraction and the ore, you know, the media made it much more available for the population to realize that what is being produced in one part of the world is actually you know, it has an, it is an impact as well on, on us as a consumer, at least. This is how I've reacted. Um, and also there is this movement, and Ruggi, as you mentioned, who had a huge role in really advancing and bringing awareness about um, human rights violations committed by corporations and that we had, you know, a role to play. And advancing that, he managed to actually galvanize enough, um, you know, in enough um, thought leaders to generate and bring about the UNGPs. In 2011, we're also, I mean, looking at major, you know, post-financial um, crisis. So I, I think, you know, geopolitically, as well as from a, a, a bigger perspective, there's so many different elements that happened in this first 10 years post-2000 that generated greater awareness. I can think about Blackwater's incidents uh, from a private security company violating, you know, human rights by killing civilians in uh, the city center of Baghdad in 2007, um, if I'm not mistaken on the date. That also had, and that was, you, especially in the United States, it was the first time that had, you know, it came home um, that these type of violations were happening. And we often not think about the private security or the private military companies, but they also, as a private security, a private entity, uh, private sector, they they have human rights, um, of course, obligations. And um, so, you know, there are multiple impacts, huge environmental disasters that happened in the early 20s that accumulated and led to the 2011 um, UNGPs. Maybe you have a different take from where you were at, at that time. No, I mean, I, I remember being in the negotiations with John Ruggie uh, when he would meet with indigenous peoples and other entities. And also was very fortunate when they were adopted, when they decided, you know, what next? Now that we have these guiding principles, what would be the next role? And maybe you could share a bit about how the guiding principles are broken down and then I know it was so exciting because we're able to then push for a forum on business and human rights to be able to meet annually in November, but also to have a working group. And I think that was one strength that we're able to accomplish to challenge slavery, to challenge all these, these modern challenges that have persisted for centuries, was to not just have one person such as Ruggie, but to have five, one from each region. And then it's been interesting to see the personality, but also what they concentrated on. We were pleased because one of the first studies that came out of that working group was by an indigenous members from Russia who then wrote a study on indigenous peoples and corporations, which of course has been one of the longest relationships if we look at human rights and the challenges that we faced over time. So it'd be interesting to hear from you, you know, how did the guiding principles break down? Uh, what a little bit about the uh, maybe national action plans or this forum on business and human rights that meets and how the working group has been able to enshrine and make sure that these rights aren't just on paper, but make a difference in people's lives around the planet. Right. I mean, you know, as as a as a consultant, the first thing that 
comes to mind when you mentioned UNGPs. I mean, we can break them down. You are probably best positioned to provide like a real academic perspective on that. But I'll give you a like from a corporation perspective. And it, you mentioned the yeah, you know indigenous peoples groups and how the NGPs actually helped, uh, in my opinion and my practical experience. You know, a lot of the issue, a lot of these standards. Our principles are often criticized by the corporations about, you know, this is nice, it's a nice framework. How do we actually implement that? How do we break this down to make it um, that we actually can do, protect, you know, um, understand, prevent, respect, and remedy if needed? So protection, understanding where your human rights risks are, this is where you know, companies were not even interested or even looking at before. Um, some of them were, especially, you know, the high level risk sectors like the extractive industry or um, the garment or agribusiness. Those were a bit more, I would say, I, I won't say advanced, but they were a bit more aware that they're, because of the ongoing discussions, problems, conflicts that they would face with communities, surrounding communities, or even the, their own labor forces. So. You know, looking at how to implement these UNGPs and also the other standards that are that apply to different um, um, sectors, I think this is where it is critical for the corporations to understand and to try to afford. You know, taking a normative approach where you take the, um, the UN declarations of human rights and you look at all the different human rights, usually, you know, kind of people, the corporations, like, no way we can handle all of, all of that. So I always recommend, you know, one of the things in order to protect, you need to understand what are the potential risks. So look at where, you know, in your supply chains, where are the most high risk um, context, where there are potential indigenous people's groups. I mean, you know, this is um, your background, this is your turf. If we, <laughs> Joshua, you think about Joshua, you think about the IP groups, of course. Um, in, in so many, you know, Central Latin Americans, um, IP groups are often connected with the extractive industry or large agribusiness. If they start looking at where these risks are more salient, and then understanding the environment in which they, op they operate, where the potential, you know, the free, um, FPIC process, so free prior informed consent that IP groups ought to give, right? Be consulted, be informed, be understanding of where these large corporations potentially, um, you know, big hydroelectrics or agro, you know, palm oil or coffee plantations, all of these things that are so common in our daily lives in terms of produce that we use have like all of these implication in terms of human rights. So in order to protect, you need to understand. So doing your proper job in conducting these due diligences, understanding the stakeholders that are involved and potentially impacted. And then, you know, and from the FPIC process and in international law, that issue of impact is critical because you can be an operation or a large, let's say, extractive industry might be operating in an area where there's six IP groups that are potentially impacted. If that comes out and then if that impact, but actually through the study and through the discussion and through the consultations, you realize that only maybe three out of six are impacted. You have to understand how to also respect, right, and remedy because if, you start by generating and opening these dialogues, which are necessary, which are, and I insist, necessary. They are good as well for those that are not necessarily impacted, but that can also generate a potential backlash where it can actually, why are these communities impacted or getting something, you know, getting um, potentially remedied if there is a violation that has been committed, um, or they will be part of a social development plan. Um, all of these have to be well understood. And often what we've seen is that companies were not, you know, completely not doing their homework, if uh, not being good students, and then, you know, ending up in clear violations by um, 
people like IP groups being completely uh, denied access to their land, uh, not being um, really relocated with the proper uh, locations where they would have similar uh, working opportunities, uh, fertility of the land, access to clean water, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you've, you've heard and you've seen, you've worked with IP groups from all over the world. I'm sure you've heard even worse stories than that. But in order for the UNGPs to apply, you need to do, to do that due diligence. And in some contexts, we're even talking now, we have 10 years plus with the UNGPs, we talk about the heightened due diligence uh, process of human rights risks, right? Where you operate in complex settings and where you need to even understand and go even deeper into what we call stakeholders' power relations analysis. Understanding who you're engaging with, who are the potential connecting um, uh, relationship that they have with the government that could be corrupt, that could be fragile, that could be connected to narco trafficking, etc. So, in order to protect, as one of the pillars of UNGPs, clear, thorough, you know, due diligence is required. Then you need to protect. You need to integrate within your full operational framework human rights risks and not just like do it as a tick block exercise, have a strategy that sits, you know, on your nice HQ or CEO's um, library and never be applied. So in order to protect, you need to understand how integrated within your risk management, within your policies or in terms of human resources, whether it's especially when we're talking about human, you know, human um, uh, recruitment processes. We we hear a lot about, you know, um, labors that are imported from, I mean, they are brought from different countries and that can generate modern slavery. The moment you are taking your passport away, where you don't have proper paychecks, where you might be underage child labor, um, you know, uh, unhealthy living conditions, etc. All of these things have to be clearly um, understood in order to be then integrated into your policies, your management, your risk management, and also like having what we call grievance mechanisms in place. The UNGPs talk about that. You know, a grievance mechanism is a system whereby if um, a, a worker or a community has a complaint, then they can lodge a complaint and then an investigation will be conducted to verify the allegations. That could then lead to a remedy, right? And there are different systems of, of remedy. It can be, you know, non-judicial and it can be judicial. Um, in many cases, of course, corporations and and um, and communities will will choose the non-judicial um, process where mediation can take place. And if there is no need for mediation, you know, a solution can be found in a common uh, through a common agreement. Judicial processes then happen as well when, you know, massive violations have been committed and there hasn't been any other remedies. But these are the three pillars. But for me, I always insist that if you are an op a large company, multinational, you have, no matter what, especially, the, I mean, we consume, we have phones, we are on a computer right now. All of these require, you know, or... Um, resources that are actually extracted from conflict or sensitive areas. And if you operate in these contexts, you need to have thorough and ongoing analysis, situational analysis, archaeology, um, archaeological analysis where, for example, I mean, I was in Myanmar a few years ago, and in some areas, you can have like around 32 communities, different communities with different backgrounds talking a different dialect. So if you don't understand that context, how do you intend to operate without potentially violating these um, people's rights? No, you did an excellent job, especially focusing on remedy, which is an area that is so crucial about this new guiding principles and why it's so important. And when you look at it, globalization is definitely a force changing and challenging many communities in every country. And corporations in partnership with multinational forces deny basic rights prevent that ability to protect, respect, promote, fulfill, and of course, as you say, remedy. And during early centuries, businesses pursued profit over people on the planet. 
However, in this 21st century, we can see people's movements have created partnerships for fundamental freedoms, reading through prior informed consent, as you shared, as well as upholding these universal values. And I really appreciate the example of talking about Myanmar, of course, because in each area where these minerals are being extracted, and of course, I loved your examples as you talk about our daily life, right? From the way people wake up from the first moment they wake up to have their coffee, to their evening when they go to bed, and to the computers and all the technologies throughout the day. There is a complicitness that we all share. And that's why these guiding principles, as well as the UN Global Compact, have been able to be tools in a way to transform and to be able to turn that page, to be able to be able to create a culture of accountability and transparency to allow more people to take and be involved. You also shared a bit about the EU, the European Union. Can you share a bit about the OECD and if it has mechanisms that also help with businesses and what those are? Yes, so the OECD, I mean, they're, uh, they're kind of the forefront of, uh, you know, in terms of advancing standards that are specific for, for um, two sectors, like, you know, multinationals operating in specific conflicts, or, or multinationals in the extractor, um, in the extractive uh, field. So uh, the OECD has, is like a thought leadership organization that has developed multiple standards that are providing guidelines on how companies ought to, you know, comply with the UNGPs. And for example, also how do they operate in, um, in conflict settings if they are, you know, extractive industry, what are the key risks and mechanisms and practices that they, they, you know, how to go about implementing in the UNGPs within um, conflict settings, for example. So the OECD is a great resource um, for, you know, any, any company that has a human rights practitioner um, or that is working uh, with human rights consultants and want to understand, okay, how do I go about that? Of course, the consultants will will provide the you know the guidance. They will know all of that. But I think it's it's important for everyone from the C-suite to the business units to understand these general guidelines. Um, understand what it actually means to pay attention. Do I need to be trained on human rights? Do I need to be trained on environmental uh, potential impacts? Um, I mean, you know, large companies operating in again, in any emerging market, will usually have, if they are uh, over certain threshold in terms of investment, or if they come from development, you know, large investment coming from the World Bank, IFC, um, EIB, European Investment Bank, uh, they will have to comply with certain, what we call the, you know, environmental impact and social, you know, is, yeah, environmental and social impact assessment. Um, the, the danger with those is to make sure that they're not just copy and pasted in some context, um, that they're actually properly, thoroughly conducted, um, and that they are not, again, just a taking the box exercise, but part of the full, you know, investment portfolio, understanding where these are coming from. And the OECD, again, provides some of these guidances on that, how to implement proper due diligence, how to ensure that the SES are carried out properly, um, guidance for multinationals uh, operating in conflict, as I said, um, and especially for the extractive industry, it's a great place to find resources. Really good points. And then as we look at where we face today, we see more and more with slavery at sea, we see more and more with people, as you share, getting their passports taken away. What have you seen in some initial initiatives by peoples around the planet to hold corporations accountable that see that we're starting to make a sea change and be able to, in a way, make a difference as we go forward with holding corporations accountable? Look, I actually, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I was in New York. Um, we met, uh, we saw each other there, but I was also, I, I met with an organization called Transparentum. Um, and this is one, um, uh, E. Benjamin Skinner is the CEO and the founder. And there are, you know, it's an organization that is looking, that is investigating uh, supply chains, especially in the garment industry. 
and they are professional investigative journalists, right? And so they actually, you know, triangulate information, they brought the evidence forward, and they actually have conversations with the corporations, giving them, you know, this is what's happening, giving them the opportunity to see, realize what is going on in your um, supply chains. And we're talking about companies that are, you know, selling all over the United States, all over Europe, everywhere around the world, large, large companies. Um, that we all know the names of in terms of, you know, the garment um, labels. And the idea that, you know, these investigations that are thoroughly conducted show the evidence, there's no doubt that this is fabricated. And giving the opportunity for these corporations to actually, you know, as you said, remedy or rectify, and especially reintegrate into their operations proper human rights due diligence, uh, human rights risk management frameworks. That I think is a great. Um, I was very pleased to see and to talk to to Ben on how you know they're going around the world and if you know they're also publicly displaying the information. So the reports are public, and the companies are aware of that. And they are you know I think there is this movement of companies doing a bit their. Um, realization that they, they can no longer operate in the in the shadows, and at some point, these violations will actually be, you know, will backlash, will be more negative, will impact their bottom line much more than if they actually take preventive and corrective measures. Um, I'm always more on the as a human rights defender or activist and practitioner saying, look. We, we've all been complicit, and you said that earlier, right? We've all been complicit. We all been, we are part of this ecosystem, but being aware and then taking the steps to actually do the right thing. And, you know, s slowly, I don't think anyone expects that this can take, you know, turn around overnight, but taking the steps to actually taking the proper approach, the human rights understanding of, um, you know, from a human rights understanding to see what are the potential corrective measures that can be taken. I think this is a great step forward. And there are a lot more entities that are actually taking um, these steps. There's a lot more pressure on transparency, a lot more pressure on accountability. And the EU, you know, CSDD is one example of this accountability. Um, it is, of course, just a little drop in the sea, but better than nothing. Oh, and it's a great point. You know, the world has created the guiding principles on business and human rights and began creating a global treaty as well to hold corporations accountable and create a transparent supply chain to ensure equality and equity for all on earth. Even this weekend, uh, today, there's the new global plastics treaty. And even though corporations have as many people as attending as a whole EU, it shows their dedication to try to, in a way, engage with these processes and that no longer can corporations not be held accountable and be part of the solution. Right. I, I mean, I prefer to have an open dialogue with, I mean, that's always my approach. Let's have an open dialogue with the corporations. Um, I think, you know, on the transparency, I'm always from a conflict sensitivity approach because of the companies that have, you know, conducted human rights due diligence have always been in these conflict settings. So. Sometimes, you know, full transparency can actually be counterproductive in the sense that you will generate and fuel more conflicts. So sometimes, yes, for a company to understand, they said, no, we don't want to publish everything. I'm, I'm not for always, you know, full disclosure, but you have to understand at some point that you need to disclose that you're taking the steps to, you know, be corrective, be transparent on some of these things, be cognizant of the potential um, drivers that you might fuel by on also your operations by not being transparent. So having, again, you know, a sort of due diligence on what your transparency would potentially generate. And, you know, as a human rights activist, I know, Joshua, you would say, ah, of course, we have to be always <laughs> um, transparent. And, uh, but sometimes it can be more detrimental to the communities um, and also maybe to the environment, I haven't tested, but on the communities, yes. 
to to be fully transparent on reports. So I think again, understanding your context is critical. Protecting, yes, by all means, human rights risks, human rights, environmental rights have to be protected by all means. Um, but that's yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> we appreciate that. And as we go into the next negotiations with South Africa and Ecuador at the lead for the uh, new treaty focusing on business and human rights, as well as the final negotiation wrapping up in Ottawa and then moving to Korea in November, we'll see if we are able to create more tools to be able to hold corporations accountable and provide an ability, as you said, really to be informed, be involved, to make a difference. And so people can be able to defend themselves and be human rights enforcers. Thank you again for joining. Aloha. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.